You're listening to Driving Law, a podcast by Kyla Lee about all things related to the rules of the road. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Driving Law. I am Kyla Lee at Acumen Law. And with me, back again. Guess who's back? Back again. Paul is back. Tell your friends. Are you doing some sort of rap rhyme thing? Yeah. Guess who's back? Back again. Shady's back. Tell a friend. Oh, okay. So it's not an original. It's not an original. It's Slim Shady. It's, it's not an original creation, though. No. You've just changed it up. Yeah. So when I was joking about writing songs a while back on Twitter, people were sending me songs that they were just changing the lyrics. Mm -hmm. And um, it's uh, been fascinating in the last two weeks how many people have uh, thought that our original musical creations were maybe somebody else's parody or something like that. Well, I mean, I like to think that on Lawyer Told Me Not to Talk to You, I totally Rachel Bloomed it up. No, by the you're way, inspired by things. Why have you not shared things. it with Rachel Bloom? Well, you should be the one who shares it with Rachel Bloom. You're friends. We're not friends. I wish we were friends. We'd be like best friends too. She uh, she <laughs> tweeted back at me when Wrigley was sick. She yeah, was lovely about it. I know. That's why I say we'd be best friends. We both like our cute little dogs and we both are weird. Lots of people are weird. Yeah, Most but... people are weird actually. It's If you get to know them a little bit, they're weird. Yeah, but it's just different. It's just different. Everybody it's... thinks they're different. Seven billion people on the planet. <laughs> yes. Most of us with two arms, two legs, two eyes, a nose, a mouth. Most of us. Yeah. I heard a story today about somebody with only one eye. Well. And I was tweeting just earlier this week about the one-armed man. And you were talking about putting an eye patch on and sitting in the back row of the Court of Appeal. Yeah, well, I mean, every once in a while I want to go and watch something, but I don't want them to recognize me and think I care. So, you know, you got to wear a disguise. I was in there getting a decision or something. I can't remember what it was. And the justice was like pointing at my robes. And I thought, what, is something flipped over wrong? Is something flipped over wrong? Then I walked out and I realized, oh, she's pointing at the fact that I've got silk robe. <laughs> and it's the first time I've been in the Court of Appeals wow. since I was QC'd. Well, I've just... Two weeks since you've been on the podcast and you're just like sliding in the humble brag about having a QC. No, the point was I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> that's why it's a humble brag yeah so it's a particularly humble brag in this circumstance and i feel quite privileged that i was qc'd looking back but i did do some things it's just people forget about it yes well we have a lot to talk about that has nothing to do with how great your qc is well i mean i'm more interested in a country music award at this point it's not coming for lawyer told me not to talk to you. I hate to break it to you, but the country music awards were like two weeks ago. So you missed them. Well, we could delay our next releases till next year and then maybe we'll be in the running. But what will the fans think? We All won't wait. two of them. As soon as they're ready. <laughs> as soon as the songs are ready, they'll be released. They're uh, on Spotify. The song is on Spotify yes, now yes. and uh, Google, Google Music, I guess. So you can download Lawyer Told Me Not To Talk To You and you can drive around listening to it. I've been listening to it on Spotify myself. I, is it wrong that I listen to my own song? Yes. Okay, I'll stop. Objectively, that is wrong. Okay. More importantly, for the listeners of this podcast who care about driving and the law and driving law and how driving law drives the law, let's talk about ICBC because there is so much that has happened with ICBC in the last week. And before we do... I want to give a special shout out to my friend Mo Amir from the This Is Van Color podcast because he literally broke the story on a big ICBC change that people have been clamoring for that is coming. His is a very popular podcast. It is. And he had David E. B. on recently. He never had me on, but he's had you on. Well, yeah. Well, yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm sure he'd have you. Except I'm an idiot. Well, you know, it's it's fine. Uh, he has idiots on. Uh, I won't say which of his guests I feel that way about, but. Have you monitored all his guests? Yeah. Hmm. He also anyway, had he's, Rebecca he, on, he Rebecca a, Bredder. Oh, okay. He does a very good interview. Not, not an idiot. I do not think Rebecca no, Bredder. She's, she's brilliant. She's brilliant. Um, you know, he does a very good interview. Yeah, he is. He's really good. He's it's a popular podcast. 
I'm kind of surprised that they he hasn't been picked up by a radio station, at least just for like a little half hour sh thing. That's coming. John McComb. He's, he's going to get something soon. Um, anyway, um, more importantly, the news that came out on the This Is That Van Color podcast, ICBC is working towards online renewals for insurance. So I guess they're going to mail you your, well, I mean, what the heck? You would log you on can, to look, you can renew literally everything else online. No, I mean, you can, you buy something on Amazon, it's delivered the next day. You can renew your insurance and they'll deliver your, your sticker to the next day, I guess. Yeah. Why not? Yeah, exactly. Ooh, that's going to hurt every one of those little. Those auto plan licenses. Remember a while ago along, like maybe... Three or four years ago, you and I were like, you know, it would be a great idea if we opened up a business running an insurance office. Yeah, we could totally do that with all our totally huge amounts of spare time. Well, it's just the space below us was open and it was an ideal yeah. location for our insurance office. Yeah, I'm not saying that it was a bad idea, but then we realized the only way you get people in the door of an insurance office is if you're selling auto plan because everybody's got to get it. And then we looked into the auto plan licenses and they are ludicrously expensive. Well, also they've capped them. Yeah. So you, the, there's only the amount out there that exists and that's it. But looking back now, probably a good idea that they capped right? them. Because think of all of those poor insurance um, agents who are going to be the facing people unemployment. people who bought them. Some people have shelled out up to a million dollars. More than that. Yeah. And they now, their investment is tanking. Because when insurance renewals are online, I know I'm not going to march down to an auto plan agent. Oh, absolutely. I'm Nobody gonna, like, will. Give you it to a, somebody else to do for me on the internet. You take a photograph of your, uh, of your, um, odometer probably. Yeah. Uh, email it in. You just self-report and certify online it's, uh, that it's true. Well, right now they want you to email a photocopy of the odometer. No big deal. Ew. That's a lot of work. It's still easier than getting in your car and driving over to Superstore on Sunday afternoon because you forgot to renew your insurance and it expires at midnight. That's me every year. That's me literally every well, year why, is yeah. doing it the day it expires. The day before. I no, hope. like the day. No. Like it's going to expire at midnight. I'd better okay. go now. After midnight. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have an uninsured vehicle. Going to have an uninsured vehicle. That's also me every year with my driver's license. Every year I look at it and I go, huh, it expires on whatever date. I'm not going to say that on the podcast. Does that mean I can drive on that day or does that mean it's already expired? And then I go, it must mean I can drive on that day. And then I drive to ICBC and get my license reinstated. After midnight. Yeah. We're going to let it all hang down. It's like literally me every, every five years. I know. So this is a uh, big news for them. Big news for ICBC. It also theoretically is going to save a huge amount of money. Ridiculous. Because if they do it online, they pay a lot less to all the people that are out there. But think of it. those, those, all those workers who will end up working in ICBC's warehouse, shipping warehouse, where they'll be, and some of them will be replaced by robots as they ship out that insurance. Look, if it's going <laughs> to <laughs> cut the bottom line at ICBC right now, I'm supportive of it. You've got you know, multi-billion dollars of debt. No, it's, it's great. And he said in the, this is Van Color podcast and everyone should listen to David Eby's episode as well as my episode and Rebecca Breder's episode and Andrew Wilkinson's episode. Um, he said 2021 is not an unrealistic timeline for when that's actually going to be available to the consumer, which is crazy because I'm already booking trials in 2021. So that's like, reasonably foreseeable future in my life in your lifetime <laughs> no, no but i mean like it's not that far away you know for, like the next federal election organization in 2.6 years um it seems like a long time from now staff in the office um younger people and when i say younger people i mean people in their 20s uh have trouble wrapping their mind around the fact that we use a fax machine to fax in submissions to road safety bc and that that's the way, them? that's the way they want it. Yeah. And they tell their family members back in, you know, wherever they happen to be from, whatever country. And 
the family members can never believe it. Like we haven't used a fax since the eighties. Um, so I never expect the government to uh, be able to get these things done. So I, 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 I think David Eby's a great guy. Uh, I'm sure he's, you know, trying to do his best. I would be shocked if they can get it done in 2021. Well, but they're the, apparently already working on it. The big fear is the uh, number of people in the insurance industry who are going to be facing a career change. They're just going to sell other types of insurance. Yeah. Like they're going to have 20% of the business or 10% of the business that they had before. Oh yeah. I mean, you walk them in the door and they come in to buy, um, you know, their car insurance and then you go, Hey, have you heard about volcano insurance? That's what it's going to be. Yeah. yeah. That's going to suck. No, I'd feel, I mean, I'm really glad I'm not a young person but who look, just started a career for once, in insurance. For once, David E.B. is not taking something to do with ICBC out on the lawyers. Just going to say that. Everything else has been detrimental to lawyers. Everything, Kyla? Yes. Name one thing that hasn't been. Exactly. Do, 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 do. <laughs> <laughs> do, 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 do. That's my little thinking well, music I'm right, there. I'm right. <laughs> yeah. It's been painful for lawyers, whether it's defense lawyers, as he said on this podcast, it's going to hurt the ICBC defense lawyers as much as it hurts plaintiff counsel, whether it's plaintiff's counsel, whether it's just the amount of PI work that there's going to be. Finally, it's not hurting lawyers. Except lawyers like us who actually followed through on the, hey, we should also open an insurance office. <laughs> there can't be that many. <laughs> no. Anyway, we were thwarted and I'm glad. Yep. I'm glad. We were thwarted by the dodged, big the big hill to climb. Dodged a bullet there. Anyway, so after David E.B. was on the This Is Van Color podcast, a story came out very next day uh, in the Vancouver Sun by Rob Shaw um, talking about how uh, breaking another ICBC related story. This is like going to be like a mostly ICBC podcast today. The second big change that's going to happen in relation to ICBC is uh, there is going to be legislation uh, tabled shortly, as in it's in its final stages of being drafted, that is going to ban governments from raiding ICBC's profits for their own whatever purposes. So a government could come along though and just change that legislation easily enough. It's not like a constitutional document or something like that, but I no. suppose the, embar the embarrassment of it would be the And you can't pass legislation thing. that binds future governments. So it would really be like a reg regulation and that regulation would be something that would be uh, easy to overturn by order and counsel of another government. But... No, think it's, of the it's not just from order and counsel. If they, if they make it a piece of legislation, they have to... They have to get rid of that piece of legislation. So they have to pass a piece of legislation. No, they can't do it that way. <clears throat> because you can't pass legislation that binds future governments. Yes, you can. It's just the future government can change it. You can't pass legislation that a future government cannot change. The way change. they're going to do it is by a regulation. Okay. So I'm telling you how it's going to happen. Fine. <laughs> So that it's easy to undo. So it's ridiculously easy to undo. But who is going to be the government? Like you're the BC Liberals, you get elected. Are you really going to undo that after everything that ICBC has gone through and after all the egg that the Liberals have had on their face about it? You know, barring all of the criticism that we've had on this podcast about changes that, I, uh, that are, are being made under the NDP government, we know that the Liberals completely mismanaged and mishandled ICBC too. So are you going to, if you get elected and back into power as the liberal government, are you going to cancel that mm. regulation? So if ICBC becomes profitable again, you can raid the coffers? Not likely. No. Actually, interestingly. <laughs> Political suicide. I mean, the, I, I still don't think Andrew Wilkinson's likely to succeed. I don't think he's. Personal? Uh, no, I, I mean, I have, uh. I don't think the criticisms of him are particularly fair. Uh, and a lot of people really dislike him. What I noticed though, is that the Gordon Campbell government was completely different than the Christy Clark government, mm -hmm. um, as far as sort of their approach and their <laughs> lack of ethics. Um, but the, um, I can't see them doing it just purely on the basis of 
the fact that so much of our political discussion since the NDP has been elected has been the liberal mismanagement of ICBC. And the liberal mismanagement of ICBC under Christy Clark was with the full intention of letting it sink so they could persuade everyone that private insurance was the way to go and that they couldn't afford to do it anymore. The NDP are trying to show that that uh, ICBC, a creation of the NDP, is still something feasible. And so they're tying the hands of a future government. They even, are, politically. Politically. Yeah, because you can't come in and be like, actually, we're going to take the profits. That didn't get us in a bad position last time. Not at all. Nope. Well, pay in for it. Now there's a Robert Cray song. Pay in for it now. I'm paying for it now. I don't know that one. It's a good one. My rap at the beginning was clearly more, more. Here comes a mother with the suitcase and I'm paying for it now. Sure. Anyway, the very interesting to see that they're bringing this in. My big question is why did it take so long? Like, I mean, it's been three years almost of David E.B. going. Has it been three years yep. almost? When was the election? Was it two years ago? Two years ago in spring. Like last spring. Was it? I I remember walking to vote and then running into my neighbor and I wanted to say anyone but Anton. But then I thought I probably shouldn't tell him who to vote for. Yeah, I remember sitting with my son in the car and listening to the day that Christy Clark went and met the lieutenant governor and... That didn't go well. Well, no. <laughs> I, I can form a stable government, I promise, even yeah. though I don't have oh, a majority. Any chance for a majority. <laughs> and these um, other people are ready to do it. And there's been a no God, conference. that was high drama, eh? That was high drama. Yeah. Those were, like, intense days. Maybe that's why they feel like they were so long ago. Anyway, so whatever. Two and a half years. It's been a while of listening stable, to the government stable say. Stable government. You know, the previous government did this and we think it's bad. Why did it take them so long to put this legislation together and it's still not even tabled? Like, it seems to me that that would be the first obvious thing you do. Well, this was clearly not working. We'd better draft legislation to prevent this. Well, then it's political, Kyla. So they're doing it to keep it on the radar to remind everybody that the liberals did it because we're going to have an election in a year and a half. Does David E.B. really get any political capital any more from saying the liberals screwed over ICBC? Like, that narrative is so played out. Yeah, but when the election comes, you can say, we passed legislation to make sure that this doesn't happen again. Oh, so it's like a, it's a, we passed legislation uh, so they can point to it in the future. Exactly. Well, that's sad. Well, that's politics. Well, politics continues to depress me. I say this, having recently lost an election. That's true. That's a good reason to be depressed. It, it is a good reason to be depressed. And I did get rather sad. You know, the day I, the know, day I, I heard, uh, I, I was all right with it until about three o'clock. Then I had a little cry in my office. I was hmm. sad. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I usually have a cry in my office at about three. It was also a Friday, so it was time for a cry in the office. <laughs> Mm. Three o'clock on a Friday, crying time again. There's a song for you. I have too many song ideas as it is. <laughs> no, crying is a song. So it's crying time again. You're going to leave me. I don't know that one. I can see that far away look in your eyes. No, you don't know mm. it? Anyway, no. I can tell by the way you hold me, darling. It's okay, fine. But it won't be long before it's I was visiting time. my dad in the hospital. And uh, I, I was... Um, Singing, I haven't got time for the pain. I haven't got time for the pain. Okay. I promised you this was going to be an all ICBC podcast. And I have yet another ICBC topic for you today. I know. Are you worn out on ICBC yet? Ickbick. Ickbick. So, as you recall, as Eric McGracken came and talked about in detail with us. Well, yeah, you've had good guests, not just me lately. You had uh, you had Ron, you had uh, you had, had Yanni. Moore, I had Jan Seminoff, I had Eric McGracken. I'm hoping to get someone from Sense BC next uh, week. Next week, so we should be talking about that. No, I don't want to steal their thunder. Um, no. So, as you recall, 
uh, you and I talked about this briefly, and then we did it more in depth with Eric. Um, there was a court ruling from the Chief Justice. ICBC's caps were unconstitutional. Yeah, as we talked or about the, that. Or the expert caps, expert, rather. The yeah. expert caps. The other caps still have their constitutionality yet to be determined. And the big question has been, will that be appealed? And the answer is that they're not going to appeal it. They're not going to appeal it, no. Which you would think initially is good news. You'd be like, okay, finally, he sees that you can't just, like, control the court's process and the court has the right to control its own process. And then they're going to let these trials unfold and let people produce all of their evidence and realize that lawyers producing evidence in their clients' cases is not the problem, as we talked about with Eric. But no. No, because they still see that from their perspective, they have a problem and they're going to try and come up with some other solution and they just see that they've been thwarted in this angle. It doesn't mean that they're going to not try some other yes. method. So it was announced, uh, I believe yesterday, uh, which would have been Wednesday on the day that we're recording this podcast, um, that uh, in the next spring's legislative session, the BC government is going to be putting forward amendments to the British Columbia Evidence Act. Now that's one way you can control the court's process. If you legislate in legislation, you're allowed to legislate, not court rules, where you can't just unanimously change them. But the Evidence Act, you can unanimously change. Well, not you, not, you still have to pass it in the legislature, but once it's passed. When there's a government that has a majority, they have a dictatorial power. Mm -hmm. They don't you have a majority, only, though. You can only criticize it. You've got enough of a majority. Yeah. <laughs> the green greenies are in there. Majority light. So, exactly what the expert cap rule in the court rules did, the legislation amendments to the Evidence Act will limit the number of adversarial expert reports and include a narrow, narrow, judicial discretion to allow additional experts in select cases. So they can spend some more extra time in court arguing. I bet judges will just allow it. Well, I mean, this is the thing. Like, you can challenge the constitutionality of the Evidence Act procedure, but you're going to have a real uphill battle because what constitutional right is engaged there? I'm asking you. Do you need your thinking music? Yeah. Um, do, 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 do. Do, 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 As you, as you were saying that, I was looking at the floor and thinking about something else. Uh, and thinking about how, just how we got here. Um, it's very, yeah. it's very frustrating. It is frustrating. It's frustrating to be a lawyer and to see that we got here because of political mismanagement and that it is affecting, I mean, not our clients because we don't do these cases, but it's affecting people. And I don't like it when... The government has screwed something up, and they take it out on people. I don't like it. It's not fair. I well, hate unfairness. The other thing I don't like is, you know, the court will close a door, and they'll find some other way. Uh, the IRP scheme, the court closed the door. The government just found another way. And then after the, the government found the other way, they got the stamp of approval, and now they just can make it worse and worse and worse, and Manitoba's making it, you know, arguably further from what was considered acceptable when it was ruled on. And here we've got the government again. You know, the government's got all sorts of methods. They have legislative power. So easy for them. Change the Evidence Act. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, I look at it and I still see that residual discretion. And that residual discretion, judges tend to grab onto those things. And yeah, but if you make it too narrow then it's not really residual discretion. If you make it so high of a bar to meet, and you and I know about the reverse onus in the IRP scheme, if you make the bar so high that it's unmeetable, then it's not discretion. It's the absence of discretion wearing a disguise. It's sitting in the back of the Court of Appeal in an eye patch. I, I, I know. I see what you're saying. Um, the problem is once it gets, 
once it somehow passes judicial scrutiny, then it can just be made worse and worse and worse. Yeah, I know. And that's my concern. Like, okay, yeah, it's stupid and you shouldn't limit the number of experts and that's not fair to litigants in these cases and the lawyers will fight it. But as soon as they lose that argument, as soon, and I'm not confident about a constitutional challenge to an amendment to the Evidence Act, um, as soon as they challenge that and as soon as they lose it, assuming they lose it, but still, they create a precedent. And the precedent is the government can control what evidence you can bring in court via amendments to the Evidence Act. And look at other ways that governments have tried to control evidence that you can bring in court. Look at the criminal code and all of the rules that they've put in the criminal code recently that are all being subject to numerous constitutional challenges related to impaired driving. You know, you can't get Sex this assault. maintenance record. Sex assault. Yeah, you can't bring this evidence unless the complainant is heard about it first. All these different types of things that are being put, that are, that are tying your hands about the type of evidence you can bring, and maybe they're unconstitutional if you put them in the criminal code, but we have a British Columbia Evidence Act and we have a Canada Evidence Act. And if we give the green light to government to control your right to mount a defense or to prosecute a case in a civil file through, like, limiting all of that in provisions of the Offense Act, you're doing the unconstitutional thing through a back door and you're doing it while you know fully well that you're doing the unconstitutional thing through a back door and it stinks to high heaven and it's going to create a bad precedent that's going to be exploited by future governments. And I don't like it. I don't like it at all. It stinks. And the people writing the legislation persuade themselves that this is a good idea. <laughs> yeah. And Oh, we're going to save and, so much money in ICBC cases. Yeah. And just give the reins to somebody else to screw the litigant in criminal court. Hell in a handbasket. I don't, I don't like it. That I, was my summary. It scares me. And you heard it here on this podcast. That you're scared? No. That this is what's going to happen. I'm predicting it now. That this is going to start a slippery slope. And I know you're not supposed to make a slippery slope argument. Why the hell care. not? We've seen the slippery slope with the IRPs. We've seen the slippery slope with impaired driving legislation. We've seen the slippery slope on on uh, se limits to what you can do in a sex assault case. We saw the slippery slope with the end of uh, with prelims being wiped out. Mm -hmm. um, these 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 are the slippery slopes. These are the slippery slopes. I don't like them, and I don't like that we are we are continually eroding. Chipping justice. Away. We're chipping away at justice. We're chipping away at access to justice. Access to experts is access to justice. Access to putting together your evidence and, and putting it in court and allowing a judge to control the process and decide what evidence is admissible and not admissible and what evidence advances your case and what evidence is, is just wasting the court's time. That is access to justice. What's not access to justice is what they're trying to do. And if you you can't say with a straight face that you have concerns about an access to justice crisis in this province and then try to l legislate away that very thing that you're saying we should all be concerned about. And then point your fingers at the lawyers who are just trying to make that happen for poor people. And poor people. There you go. That was uh, your speech from the balcony. That was excellent. It's, I'm sure that the, the crowds the would be cheering. No, if you were like to lead the revolution. Oh, okay. Good. Uh, Don't those people then get shot? Yeah, but they're, you, if you do it right, you're martyred. I don't, but I don't want to die. <laughs> no, well, maybe just be a... I mean, well, I like access to justice, but I'm not willing to die for it. Be a benevolent dictator when you get there. It's okay. too bad you couldn't have given that speech for your benchers election. I did. I gave yeah. a lot of access to justice speeches. People didn't watch them. People didn't listen. Well, people did. People did watch. I don't know if it was they didn't agree. They didn't care. They didn't vote. I mean, we saw a minor increase in voter turnout. That I don't was, know. That was my big concern always is the lack of voter turnout. You know, I got to say, like, I was a little ticked off at a certain reporter who made a certain comment. I know. About me on I know. Twitter. I know. Subtweeted me. I know. I'm subbing him in my podcast now. On there Revenge. you go. <laughs> I thought that wasn't fair. Because... Um, just to equate 
the number of followers you have on Twitter to the absence of getting votes, as though there's some point to be made there. There's no point to be made there when you have a profession, the majority of whom have been practicing for more than 26 years and just aren't on Twitter. And, yeah, exactly. And, and when you have an election where only a certain type of people can vote. I mean, it's not like, you know... Well, it's not that many lawyers are on Twitter either. I mean, we're on Twitter and there are other lawyers on Twitter, but there, yep. it is not that many lawyers on Twitter. I'm not conversing. I'm, I, haven't, I mean, I've got a well, bunch of direct Twitter, message. But it's like, it's an it's an international law Twitter. You've got lawyers from the US and lawyers from, from Ontario and Manitoba and, you know... Like you can have lots of Twitter followers, but if the only people that are allowed to vote for you are the lawyers that practice with an office in Vancouver proper, then it doesn't, your Twitter followers say nothing about your ability to get votes. And it's, it's a false correlation. I agree. So I thought it wasn't fair to make that comment without explaining all of the differences between this and a general election where any member of the public over 18 can vote. I agree. But there's lots of really caring media out there. Yes. Including um, Kristen Robinson, who reported on your um, quasi-driving law. Kristen Robinson, who brought that story to everybody's attention and got that person... Well, ultimately... Told his story so that somebody could help him. Yeah. So you should explain it. Take a minute. Oh. I don't know where we are in the timeline, but... We're okay. Yeah, we're, we've are we got a minute. Um, yeah, so uh, an individual was given a ticket on a SkyTrain a while ago. He had a compass card. Um, he was visiting from Calgary, tapped his compass card, didn't work, tapped again, didn't work. And his friend said, oh, no problem. Tapped his own compass card and said, follow me through. So he followed him through the fare gate, got stopped and ticketed. And he said, my compass card didn't work. I tried, I tried, it didn't work. And they reviewed ridiculous. the video too and saw that he tried. Saw that he tried. He produced in court and filed as an exhibit in his trial the compass card that he had purchased showing that he had a valid fare payment for that, for that thing. Like this wasn't a situation of somebody following through the fare gates to try and avoid the 275 Skytrain ride. This was somebody who's not from here, who was confused and distressed, also intoxicated, and... But fine, that's why yep. you, you want people on the SkyTrain because they've been drinking. Like, you don't want them in their cars. Then I'd have to represent him not pro bono. <laughs> um, so, yes, take the SkyTrain when you're intoxicated. And if something goes wrong, be something goes be wrong. Be reasonable Mistakes with happen. And, like, the police were not reasonable. They ticketed him and they prosecuted <clears throat> him. And they got a conviction. And the ticket was a nullity. Well, it was a nullity in the end, so you appealed it. You were contacted. So the, well, I, co I contacted we were not... him through okay. when I heard the story. Well, I reached out to Kristen and I said, I want to help this guy. Before that, I didn't tell you that I was contacted by somebody who wanted to pay the fine because people were so up in arms. And of course, I didn't act for him, so I didn't want to, I didn't act for the, the accused or anybody. At that point. Uh, but I went down to the court registry and I met this person who wanted to pay the fine as a favor to him, which was a lovely gesture. And I pointed at the registry and said, "There's that's where you would pay it if they'll let you pay it. And mm -hmm. yet they had no problem and took the payment. So yeah. it was Government a, doesn't care who an, they anonymous, get money from. an anonymous, lovely Vancouverite. There's some really wonderful people out there. And a lot of other people, um, I heard other people contacting me saying, How, I want to pay this guy's fine. And I was, don't worry about it. I think it's taken care of. Yeah. So the fine was paid by somebody from Vancouver. Kyla did the case pro bono. Uh, the crown lawyer who, the government lawyer who looked at it came to the same conclusion that Kyla did, which was this was the wrong section anyway. This person shouldn't have been charged with, under this, uh, under this provision and under as the far wrong as legislation. it was under the wrong legislation, shouldn't have been charged under this legislation and we're consenting to the appeal. So the, it the was backs, in court, when was it, Tuesday? It was in court on when, on Tuesday, yeah. The backstory of this is even better because when we filed the appeal, the court wouldn't add it to the list because they said this legislation, it doesn't, we, we can't hear it. We have no jurisdiction over this legislation because it's an arbitration process. And we had to say, well, no, it was heard in provincial court as a summary conviction matter and appealed. Like the whole oh, thing. Oh, I remember that. I remember that. So much, I had to write a letter to the court explaining the various different um, statutes that govern 
your conduct on transit and which ones applied in his case and which ones he was convicted under and why it was within the court's jurisdiction to hear the matter, which none of which would have happened if he'd been ticketed under the right legislation because he would have gone through the arbitration process, not court. I'm just glad that you took it, that you took it on, that you did it pro bono. It was a regular person dealing with something that all of us would look at. Most of us would look at and say, this is damn unfair. Mm -hmm. uh, the people of British Columbia who watched that on the news and the global story thought this is damn Everyone unfair. Everyone thought it was unfair. And, um, like I said, you know, I hate it when things are unfair. Well, I hate it when people see that, can see how our justice system doesn't always work. And, but for the appeal, if it hadn't been appealed, if you didn't appeal it, um, you know, it would have just been left to stand. And that's the thing that, that gets me. I mean, I, I'm, I have my problems with the justice system. I work within the justice system. I have my concerns about it, but sometimes it's just necessary to appeal it. Yep. I don't mind picking a fight. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, thank you to, uh, Kristen Robinson for making that happen. I have to say thank you generally to the media. I know you're, you know, yep. angry with one reporter right now, but I'm just, my, my feelings are hurt. Mm -hmm. It was, it was, it was a kicking a man when he's down, you know. On Tuesday, I was on JRFM. Oh, yeah. I was interviewed. <laughs> okay. We got, by I, three I, hosts. I said we had a minute here. About our song. And uh -huh. it was lovely. They were so wonderful. And this is the first time that it wasn't a law related interview with me. And uh, they played our song. Apparently, they played it again because Sarah um, in our office. Really wonderful article student. Um, she uh, she heard it after I was on, so they played it twice. Okay. Shout out to JR FM, ninety three point seven country music, Lower so, Mainland. Our other topic that I was going to talk about with you is going to have to wait now for another week because we've wasted too much time on this. What about our driver? Do we have a driver? Well, this is what we have to get to: is our ridiculous driver of the week, and I have not told you yet what it is. Oh, is it me? No. no. No, because this is so good. Okay. This happened on I-5 in Washington uh, near Lakewood. If you've ever driven down um, from Vancouver into, uh, into Seattle, this is near Lakewood, which closed all of the I-5 lanes for 13 years. Hours. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That's like the entire of Washington state must stop. Yes. <laughs> and this was the most weird constellation of unrelated events that you could possibly imagine involving shrimp, cheesecake, and a hit and run. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so. Let's hear it. I-5, there is a uh, semi-truck, totally normal day semi-truck uh, for Cheesecake Factory full of shrimp and cheesecake. Just shrimp and cheesecake. Catches fire. Um, nobody knows why yet that it caught fire, but a truck fire. Now, shrimp ordinarily. Shrimp and cheesecake. Shrimp and cheesecake truck fire. So ordinarily, of course, commuters can deal with a truck fire. You close the lane, you put them, you know, and get the fire trucks out. No put big deal. Put the truck out. Yeah, yeah, put the truck out. But while emergency crews were there doing just that, an SUV comes barreling along through the closure and crashes into two fire trucks, a patrol car, a Department of Transportation vehicle, and a civilian vehicle that had stopped at the scene. Oh my goodness. Was so the SUV he, being driven by the Terminator or something? The like? SUV hits five vehicles, four of which were emergency vehicles oh that had their lights on that he should have seen. Um, rips off the door of the Department of Transportation vehicle, um, and obviously the driver and uh, his passenger had serious injuries. Now, it gets better. How does this SUV come to smash into the scene of a burning semi-truck containing cheesecake and shrimp, shrimp and emergency vehicles everywhere? He's fleeing from sheriff's deputies who are doing a high-speed chase down I-5. Into this other <laughs> traffic incident. They, they couldn't have radioed ahead to the... Uh, I guess not. Oh my goodness. Or I guess maybe... So they it was the Terminator. It was like literally the... Yeah. 
This happens at four o'clock in the morning. So like, there's no traffic on I-5 at that time. I say no, I mean, there's, I mean, there's traffic on I-5 the that entire time. Yeah, I know, but it's gotta be backed up if you, if, if you have anything by go then, wrong. By then, yeah. And then um, like they reopened two lanes by 9 a.m. And eventually by noon, uh, the backups were 13 miles long. <laughs> oh my goodness. It's not funny. I feel sorry for those it poor is, people. You got to get is, to the airport. You got to get funny. somewhere. It's funny because that is like the weirdest series of events. Like how often does a police chase crash into a burning truck full of cheesecake and shrimp? I'm just wondering, is like the shrimp on one side, the cheesecake on the other? Is this like... Are they on pallets? Yeah, put on another pallet of shrimp. Do you have some room? Yeah, throw on a pallet of cheesecake. Yeah. And what lit fire? Was it the cheesecake or the shrimp? I, or was it the fuel? I have no idea. Um, anyway, if maybe, you... Maybe cheesecake and shrimp, if you put them together, it's like dropping a, uh, a menthos in a Coke bottle. If you're listening to this with a um, computer in front of you, Google cheesecake shrimp crash. There are pictures. You will not be sorry. There's some pretty crazy photos. I will do that when I get home. So that is our ridiculous driver of the week. I don't know who's the ridiculous driver of the week in that situation. I think it's just a it's general the SUV driver. The SUV title. driver. Nah, the cops. The, everyone. Everyone's to blame there. Um, it's a shared title by many. Um, at that is our Driving Law Podcast. Thanks, Who's Kyla, for having me on once again. Yeah, nice you, to see you. It's welcome. You're I, welcome I, back. I didn't even know your Tuesday... Your big Tuesday news, I didn't know it until I saw it on the news today. You literally didn't know that I was in court dealing with all that? I saw that you were wearing your your Batman outfit, but I didn't, uh, your robes, but I didn't get to, I didn't know what it was. Oh. I thought you were doing something else. I thought maybe you were in the court of appeal. No. No, so for no, once I was winning in court. Me, <laughs> well, you win in court all the time. Uh, yeah, it just, you know, it was good to get a... Get a W under the belt. Yeah, you've had a few, but they, you've had a, you've had, yeah, y- y- the problem is that you have hundreds of these consent ones. Yeah, I know. And then the ones that they don't consent to, they want to fight out and it's just, it's you know. It's harder. Well, they're harder cases to fight. They're, yeah. they're ones that, you know, you think of how many IRPs you've got them to consent to, probably literally into the hundreds. Mm-hmm. Definitely into the hundreds. Um, uh, that you've appealed. And then when you have to go and fight them out, you know, they're not picking the uh, ones that they are going to consent to. Obviously, they feel that they've got a very strong argument. And sometimes the judges buy their argument instead of yours. I know, but I feel like I have a strong argument when I do it. Oh, I, I, your arguments are great. That's not what the judges always say. A lot of the Supreme Court judges are very sympathetic to your arguments, but so many of those Supreme Court decisions end up overturned at the Court of Appeal that I think that they get to the point where they're thinking to themselves, well, there's no point in me doing what I think I should do. And the reasonableness standard of review is a nasty thing and the concept of deference permits injustice. As we've talked about on this podcast and soon, maybe, we'll get a decision on the uh, admin law hearings from the Supreme Court of Canada. About which we have our bet. Oh yeah, when is the bet? When is it? It's, you're you're running out. We're gonna have to go back and listen yeah. to that podcast because I think I'm gonna make my. I thought it was gonna be after October. Yeah, you said it was gonna be after they they do their midterm exams or something. Because mm-hmm. or before want... you said it was gonna be. Before. Oh, I can't remember. Jesus, yeah. I think I'm gonna owe you another. No, I think another ten dollars. Yeah, I thought we bought, bet a hundred bucks. Oh God, no. Okay, let's sign off this podcast. Bye, everybody. You don't want to hear about our petty trivial arguments about <laughs> when we bet, bet what. Um, <laughs> if you know when we made our bet and what the terms of our bet was, contact yeah. us at vancouvercriminallaw.com or give us a call 604-685-8889 and tune in next week for another episode of Driving Law where maybe we'll have figured out the details of this bet.